Okay, we are in uh, Vital Pursuits. The subtitle of it is Developing My Spiritual Life. This is session number eight, and it's entitled Meditating On and Memorizing God's Word. And our primary scripture is Psalms 119, verses 97 to 102. So session eight, Meditating On and Memorizing God's Word. Psalms 119, verses 97 to 102. And we will be using other scriptures as well. So as we get started, let's talk about the other seven uh, disciplines that we have talked about briefly. We started off talking about talking to God. And we answered three questions. The first question was, why should I talk to God? The answer, because he would like us to do. Just like any parent likes to have their children talk to them, God, as our Father, likes to have us talk to Him as well. What should I talk to Him about? Well, the model prayer gives us a good model for that. We should talk to Him about whatever we want to talk to Him about. But we should, in our prayer, have a time of praise, a time of confession, a time of acknowledging our need for Him, and a time for thanking him for what he has done to us. Then our second session was on listening to God. So the reverse of talking, we need to listen as well. And we talked about the various ways God has spoken to people in the past. And then we talked about how today the primary means of him talking to people is through his word, the Bible. And a number of our sessions have dealt with the Bible, just like the one tonight. And we'll continue to talk about it next week as well. We should be quiet so that we can hear what God has to say. But more importantly, we should be prepared to respond to what he has to say. In our third session, we talked about the need to be part of a spiritual community. Uh, both Luke in the book of Acts and Paul in the book of Romans encouraged believers to be devoted to each other. And that means not only to be uh, affectionate to one another, it also means to meet each other's needs. And we talked about the different purposes and benefits of being in a spiritual community. Benefits include such things as encouragement, encouragement to study God's word, to pray, to worship, to meet the needs of other members of the community, and to draw others to Christ as well. And the benefits include just mutual encouragement in all areas of life. Then in session four, we talked about worship, and we talked about the two different types of worship. In the Old Testament, worship was uh, worshiping at a distance. Remember the Israelites at Mount Sinai. They worshiped from the foot of the mountain while Moses went up to the top to meet with God. In the New Testament, though, the word worship means to be close to, close enough to hold the hand up, the persons you're worshiping. And we talked about what it meant to worship God in spirit and in truth. In spirit means what our emotions, our feelings, and in truth means to study and understand who God is so that it's not an emotional reaction to him, but it's also a um, knowledge reaction. We know who it is that we are worshiping. In session five, we talked about giving to God. And we talked about giving being an expression of faithfulness. We are stewards. We are called to take what God has given us and use it to acknowledge him and to use it to benefit others as well as ourselves. We talked about giving us an expression of worship, of gratitude, and most importantly of trust. We trust God for what he has given us in the past. We trust him for the future as well as the present. In session six, we talked about spending a daily time with God, and we do that so that we can seek God's presence, so that we can become more intimately involved with him, to know him better. We talked about a daily time with God so that we can listen to what he has to say to us and to respond to what he has said, and striking a balance between listening and responding. 
you can kind of see how all of these things kind of go together, I hope. And then last week in session seven, we talked about how to study God's word. We talked about the value of a time of personal Bible study. It's a way of, again, developing our knowledge of who God is. And it's also the fact that studying his word leads to wisdom, as Solomon says in the Proverbs. But the most important thing that we talked about last week was that in order to study God's word, you need the tools, such as Bibles, uh, dictionaries, commentaries, concordances. But in addition to having the tools, you need to have a plan. How is it that you're going to do it? Are you doing a book study? Are you doing a, a verse study? Are you doing a word study, a character study? It doesn't really matter. You need to have a plan. And then this week, we're moving on to another subject that deals with God's Word, and that is meditating and memorizing God's Word. So as we start, I have a question for you. You have been let out of the house. We've all been cooped up for a while, but for whatever reason, today you have a free day. All the stores are open and you have elected to spend part of your day browsing in a bookstore. There's nobody else in the bookstore but you. You can browse the aisles as long as you want and look at any genre you want to look at. So what two sections of the bookstore would you be most likely to spend your time? Well, for me, I'd pick two and there are two where most of my authors reside. So one would be science fiction authors. I like people like Asimov and Clark, and I really like the Star Wars series. I've got several hundred books, paperbacks, of Star Wars stories. And in addition to Star Wars and science fiction, I would look in the thrillers and mysteries section. Things like Tom Clancy, Robert Ludlum, John Ladd, these are all writers that I enjoy reading. So if you were to look on my shelves of paperbacks, you would find lots and lots of Star Wars books and books by either Ludlum or Clancy. Or if I really want to branch out, I'd have Michael Shara who does military fiction. I'm sure your answers are probably different than mine. We all have different preferences when it comes to authors and the types of things we like to read. But one thing we should all have in common is that we like and have a passion for God's Word. Last week, we talked about how it is that we should study God's Word. Well, this week, we're going to move on to meditating on and memorizing God's Word. And then next week, we're going to talk about applying God's Word. So we need to know how to study God's Word. We know how to listen to God and to respond to what He's saying. We need to be able to study it and apply it. But somewhere there in the middle, we need to be talking about meditating and memorizing God's Word. And we're going to look at two aspects of that. And they both have to do with misconceptions. What's the misconceptions that we have concerning meditating on God's Word and what's the misconceptions that we have over memorizing God's Word? And as I went through the lesson, there are a number of these misconceptions, which I have to say, I probably had as well as you. So let's take a look at what those misconceptions are. So the text we're going to look at again is Psalms 119, verses 97 to 102. Reading from the New International Version. Oh, how I love your law. I meditate on it all day long. Your commands make me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever with me. I have more insight than all my teachers, for I meditate on your statues. I have more understanding than the elders, for I'll, I obey your precepts. I have kept my feet from every evil path, so that I might obey your word. I have not departed from your laws, for you yourself have taught me. 
Okay, and then here is the Holman version. How I love your teachings. It is my meditation all day long. Your command makes me wiser than my enemies, for it is always with me. In the original Hebrew, the word that is translated as teaching can also be translated as law. You remember in the New International, it says, oh, how I love your law. In the Holman, it says, how I love your teaching. Same basic Hebrew word is used and translated differently in both. But the uh, kernel of meaning in it refers to the moral and ethical teachings of the Old Testament. So what's in the Mosaic Law and what's in the Psalms and the Proverbs? This is, you know, possibly King David talking, and he's talking about how he loves to listen to what God has to say for him. So verse 99, I have more insight than all my teachers because your degrees are my meditation. A decree is like a law. It's intended to be binding. It's intending to be something that is uh, locked into place. It's something that we should always do. Verse 100, 100. I understand more than all the elders because I obey you precept, your precepts. So the elders come from a, again, a Hebrew word that refers to the builded ones. So elders here refer to people because of their age and experience, really understand and know God's law and are very wise. And we talk about degrees and precepts. Degrees are laws that are locked into place. Precepts are like principles. The idea is this is a guide for living. And 101 says, I have kept my I have kept my feet from every evil path to follow your word. I have not turned from your judgments, for you yourself have instructed me. So not only did the psalmist, possibly David, learn from the elders and from uh, listening to his teachers, he also learned from listening to God. Remember up there, it's how he meditated on his law and on his precepts. He studied God's word. So, therefore, he was taught by God himself. So, with that as a background, let's take a look at the misconceptions that deal with meditation and the misconceptions that deal with memorization. So, first off, meditation. So, what do you think of when you think of meditation or meditating? Well, there's probably three general misconceptions. One is the purpose, one is how complex it is, and one is the practicality. If you're like me, the first thing you probably thought of when you think of meditation is somebody sitting very, very quietly, possibly in a lotus position, which I can never get into, but sitting very, very quietly and very still and just thinking of nothing, just emptying your mind. This is kind of what Eastern meditation is all about. We want to create a detachment from the world around us so that we are kind of in our own little bubble where we're not thinking about anything. We're just thinking into a void. Well, that's not Christian meditation. Here's the big difference. While Eastern meditation wants you to empty your mind, Christian meditation wants you to fill your mind. Flip over to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, verse 2 says, do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. Renewing of your mind means to fill your mind with what? 
with God's Word. So Eastern meditation wants you to empty your mind and think of being in a void. Christian meditation wants you to fill your mind with God's Word. So go back to last week. Last week we talked about the need to study God's Word, to have a plan on God's Word. Well, when you have a plan and when you study God's Word, you need to spend some time thinking about God's Word. How does this apply to you? How am I going to respond to it? Etc. <clears throat> so the other misconception people have it is very complex to do this. It's not easy. And again, I think of Eastern meditation. I can never get into the lotus position. I'm not sure I could have done it when I was a kid. Secondly, I'm not sure I could have sat still that long as a kid or even now. We think of it as being very mystical and very difficult to do for the average person. In reality, for Christian meditation, God will bring his word to mind. You just need to be ready to listen when his word comes to mind. And maybe it's just sitting for a couple of minutes thinking about a verse or you're watching TV or something is happening and God's word will come to mind. And when it does, you need to stop a minute and you need to think about why did this particular verse come to mind? Why is God's word coming to mind for me? And then lastly, what are the benefits of meditation? Is it just to quiet your mind and not think about anything? Or is there some practical benefits from it? Well, let's go back to our scriptures. And let's start at verse 98. Verse 98 says, Your command makes me wise. So studying God's word, both here and in the Proverbs, it says that studying God's word brings wisdom. Verse 99 says, I have more insight. Studying God's word gives us insight on his thoughts and how we should respond to them. Verse 100 says, I understand more than the elders. So studying God's word gives me superior understanding of what he wants of his followers. In verse 101, I have kept my feet from every evil path to follow your word. If we know God's word, we're, we're getting ready to stray when we're tempted. As in Jesus in his temptation, we have God's word to fall back on to resist that temptation. We have to remember, looking at the Psalms, that Christian meditation or meditation on God's word is not something new. It's something that's been around for longer than the Bible. It's been around forever, if you will. We need to carefully study the scripture, but when we meditate on it, we need to internalize what it's saying to us and personalize it to our own lives. The example that I would give you is making a cup of tea. Now, I'm not a coffee drinker, but I like tea. And just think for a minute about making a cup of tea. You get the hot water and you get the tea back. And if you want to have some weak tea, you dip the tea bag a couple of times. But if, like me, you want a strong tea, you'll either dip it a couple of times more or you'll just let it sit in it. You'll just leave the tea bag in the hot water and let it seep for a while till it gets really strong. Because I like strong tea, particularly if it's hot tea. And that's kind of how we need to be when it comes to meditating on God's Word. We don't want to just stick our toe in it. We want to immerse ourselves in it and internalize it and think about it with a purpose. So that's 
the misconceptions on meditating. What about the misconceptions when it comes to memorizing? Well, let's go back to Psalms 119. Memorization, like meditation, is totally misunderstood. Many people think that memorization of Scripture is really hard. Think back to when you were a child. We memorized verses all the time. And we memorized the most part in the King James, which had a lot of these and vowels and some of those strange English words. And some of those verses still resonate with us today. And when we read something in the Holman or the New International, God will bring the original King James that we studied to our mind. So memorization isn't hard. It doesn't require superior intellect or large blocks of time. But like studying God's Word, it does require a plan. It's not something you're just going to sit down and read a verse and it'll stick in your mind. Oh, it could, but probably not. So you need a plan for it. And importantly, there is a reason for doing it. There is a benefit from uh, memorizing God's Word, just as there are benefits for meditating on God's Word. So let's look at some of the benefits. We'll start again in Psalms 119, but this time we're going to start with verse 11. So 119, verse 11, says, I have treasured your word in my heart, God's Word, so that I might not sin against you. God's Word if we have it memorized, we have it in our heart, when we're tempted, again, like Jesus in his temptation, we can bring God's word forward, and it helps us to resist that temptation. Again, Psalms 119, verse 50 says, This is my comfort in my affliction. Your promise has given me life. If we're having a hard day, if we're not feeling well, if we're feeling afflicted, as it says here, God's Word can be a comfort. It can help us when we face adversity. And then in verse 105, it says, Your Word is a lamp for my feet and a light on my path. Again, God's Word can help us when we make decisions, that we make decisions that are pleasing to God. And then in the New Testament, one other benefit. This is 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. It says, But set apart the Messiah as Lord in your heart, and always be ready to give a defense to anyone who asks for a reason for the hope that is in you. So knowing God's Word and meditating on it allows us to be ready to answer the question, why are you a believer? You don't have to stutter. You don't have to sit and try to come up with reasons. You'll already have reasons in your mind as to why you are a believer. And we'll have a witness then for those who are not to bring them to belief. So, let's look at five practical methods for scripture meditation. We've talked about the misconceptions, and we've said you needed a plan for meditation. We've talked about memorization, and we've said you need a plan for memorization. So, let's look at the first one. Here are five practical methods for meditation. So, you have read a portion of scripture. How do you meditate on it? Well, first you sit quietly without distraction. And depending on what you read, try to visualize it in your mind. If the scripture is like a story that you've read on a character from the Bible, sit there and visualize that story, maybe like you were watching a, a video. Visualize in your mind what's happening in the story that you just read. Well, let's say it's not a story. 
but it's not really anything action-wise going on. Well, take your scripture, one or two verses, try reading it over and over again out loud. Perhaps as you read it, emphasize different portions of the scripture. Maybe a, an inflection on something. Or you could paraphrase it. Maybe as we do in our studies, read it from several different versions. Maybe try to put it in your own words. But remember, meditation is internalizing and um, personalizing it. So, depending on how, again, what you're reading, personalize it. If it says you, don't say you, put your name in there. You know, that verse from 1 Peter, if it says you need to do this, put in your name. James needs to do this. Or so-and-so needs to do this. And lastly, pray it. You can pray scripture. Each of those are ways of meditating on God's word. You don't try to do all of them with one set of scriptures. But they're all useful for different types of scripture. So how about memorization? Well, here are some strategies for memorizing God's word. First, start with verses that have a special meaning to you. We all have favorite memory verses. So start with them. They're the ones that would be the most likely for us to internalize and memorize. So start with one that has special meaning for you. As you read it aloud, and you need to do this several times, say the reference front and back. So John 3.16, for God so loved the world, so forth. John 3.16. Say it several times. If it's a longer verse, and some verses can be quite long, particularly if it's in Paul's letters, he tends to write long sentences, break the verse down into parts and learn the parts. Again, as you read it, emphasize certain words, kind of like meditating you know, you emphasize certain words so they'll stick in your mind. Another way of memorizing is to write the verse on an index card. That way you can carry the verse around with you or you can hang it up on your mirror. So when you go get up in the morning and you go to the bathroom to shave or put on your makeup, depending on who you are, there's the verse on the mirror. It will remind you of that verse. And at that point, read the verse over two or three times. You do that several mornings and you'd be surprised. It'll stick. And the last one is put the verse to music and sing it. Well, I'm not a singer, so I'm not sure that one would work for me. But the other ones would definitely. When I need to memorize something, it helps me to do it, to read over it several times, several days, and then I know what's going on. For instance, like when we're doing these lessons or we're doing the Sunday morning lessons, I will do the layout of the lesson two or three weeks in advance because I like to be ahead. But then before we actually take the lesson, I'll read over things again and I'll read over the source material again, usually. And that will give me ideas of things to say that maybe I didn't write down. You make it more personal that way. And that's what we need to do for meditating or memorizing God's Word. To meditate on it or to memorize it, make it personal and it'll stick. Well, that's all for this week. Next week, we're going to move on to applying God's Word. We've talked about reading and studying, memorizing and meditating. All of that's great, but if we don't do something with it, it's just a lot of, I won't say useless, but it's all information and not something that we're using. So next week, we're going to talk about applying God's Word.
So let's close tonight with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we have to study your word. We pray that you will help us to personalize and to internalize your scriptures. Help us that it is words that we can use in our lives that are important to us, that will be guides for our daily living, that will keep us from temptation, but that will bring us to a fuller understanding of who you are. And now as we close for tonight, just be with us as we finish up the week. May we be together virtually on Sunday as we worship together. For we ask it in your name. Amen.